Okay, so today uh, we're looking at um, at a a new platform called Vivarium. Um, this uh, this is the the final build a cell modeling tutorial. So kind of fittingly, we're looking at at things that are on the very cutting edge. Um, new new development, kind of a uh, somewhat new approach. To, to modeling many of you might not be familiar with. This one is uh, more heavy on the software design elements than our previous five lectures, which were a little bit more towards the math um, uh, with computational modeling software is important and uh, taking the, the design into consideration allows us to get um, much more complex models. Okay, so to start, I want to uh, address the challenge of model integration in computational biology. There's been a proliferation of different modeling frameworks, some of them specialized for different biological phenomena. So you might have constraint-based approaches to metabolism. We've been looking at a lot of chemical reaction networks and uh, agent-based modeling is popular, especially for multicellularity. I'd like to point to the fact that in biology, uh, all of these different uh, systems are integrated together and they operate together. And so our, uh, our models of them should also become integrated if we want to model how biological systems operate as a whole. And so enter Vivarium. This is an open source modular platform where models can be combined and recombined at any level of detail. It's based on a synthesis of several different uh, modeling and simulation approaches. Uh, the, it, it comes from uh, whole cell modeling, which is the, the main research uh, being done in, in uh, the lab I work in at Stanford. Uh, but we've extended whole cell modeling with agent-based modeling, so we can have many individual processes running in parallel in a distributed way. Uh, we also have elements of multi-scale simulation, so we can simulate uh, systems at different temporal and, and spatial scales. And finally, for ease of integrating modules, we've adopted some modular computational design principles. For those of you familiar with any of these approaches, you'll see elements of these in the lecture. I won't be uh, pointing them out specifically, but they're distributed and synthesized within Vivarium. Okay, so a quick outline of what we'll be looking at today. For this first lecture, we, we focus on concepts. We are going to look at the interface of how models become modules that can plug together. The engine is, is how these run together in time in a multi-scale fashion. And collective is, uh, will point at the measures we've taken to make development as easy as possible by a community of developers. And, and finally, for this first part of the tutorial, we'll, we'll look at just a few examples. After number four over here, we will stop uh, the recording, take some questions, and then resume to, to show uh, a coding demo, which will look at how all of the concepts introduced in this first part are implemented in code. And then we're taking a different, we're, we're kind of venturing away from the previous five lectures. We're not going to do a breakout groups with examples, but instead we're going to be looking at a very recent uh, project done for this class in collaboration with the Vivarium team and the, the Bioscrape team. So the Vivarium team is at Stanford, Bioscrape team is at Caltech, and we've been synthesizing these two efforts. We'll show you a little bit of that. Okay, so to start with the interface, Vivarium 
supports these modules distributed across a hierarchy of embedded nodes. On the left, pointing to the fact that life itself is multi-scale, so that the behavior observed at one scale is driven by events that could be much faster and much smaller, uh, but also much bigger and perhaps slower. So, so you know, for example, the cell is driven by events that really matter in its dynamics that need to take in, this into account. Uh, Vivarium adopts, this is a, probably a, a framework most of you are not familiar with. Bigraphs are a formal framework for multi-scale systems. Here it's, it's like a, a network, which you know, networks are very popular these days, but bigraphs are networks with embeddable nodes. So here you can have one node inside of the other. Uh, this not only reflects the functional organization of living systems, it also turns out to simplify how models are integrated. So we'll see, we'll see how that works now. So for, for Vivarium, the very basic elements are processes and stores. Processes are where your model sits and stores are where the, the state variables are held. We're using a database flowchart symbol here and a process flowchart symbol for, for the processes. I'd like to also point, point out that this is merely a kind of a computational equivalent of the basic uh, function state separation that you might have in a system of ODEs. So the processes would be the functions that, that update your, your states here, here in X. And we wanna keep these things separate so that we can combine functions together with different states and, and across this hierarchy. So uh, a topology connects processes through their ports. We'll see how this works, but, but we can snap a lot of processes together to different stores, and then this whole thing runs together as a multi-scale system. Here's just kind of an example of what this might mean, a very minimal example. We could have two processes, one of growth, where we have this exponential growth function that takes the mass and, and a growth rate and gets you a, a new mass after some period of time. We connect it through this one port to a store that holds the current state of the mass. And then there's a second process called division that it triggers division once mass passes a threshold. And we connect that to the same store so that it can read that variable as it grows. And when we run it, we start it off here at 1300 femtograms. It grows exponentially, hits this threshold and divides and this repeats. And so this is kind of a very minimal use case of two, two processes with one shared store and just a single variable in that, inside of that store. Next up, we, we're, we're building upon the concepts, uh, a topology of stores and processes connected together can be embedded in a hierarchy. So this is using the bigraph structure. At a given level inside of one node, so here the, this blue rounded square represents a node, we put processes and stores inside of one, but we can connect processes out of the, like, like across the compartment, across the node to a boundary store that can plug into a, uh, a node that's above or below. We're here showing an embedded compartment as a place graph. So the very, very top node over here might be like an environment or the universe. And then inside of it, it has a store that can connect to sub nodes and this is embeddable arbitrarily as far as you want. So that's how we, we plug processes across this hierarchy. Okay, so, so that uh, concludes the, the representation uh, used by, by Varium. Now we're going to look at the engine, which is how these things run in time. So once you have a full model with many processes connected across the hierarchy, you can execute it. 
Uh, this is over here, a basic update loop where the store, which holds your state variables, passes a view of the relevant variables to, the, to each process through the ports. The process runs the mathematical model, passes back an update, and then this is applied within the store and, and you go around and around and around until your simulation is done. This is your, your kind of a basic simulation cycle. And the, the, the time scales themselves can be updated during runtime if needed. Here we see the, the view and update uh, going back and forth from each process as it unfolds in time. Let's say this process on the bottom gets a view of current state at the start of its time step. It runs for delta T2 and then it passes back an update, which then gets applied in the store. Uh, but in the meantime, the first process might have run a few times. And, and so the, the, the state is constantly being updated in this dynamic way as the time advances. Now, this, in addition to running at multiple timescales, these processes can run in parallel. Uh, we just uh, set each process and really simply just you pass in a variable, a parameter that says this is a parallel process and the engine does this for you. It puts your process onto a separate thread of execution. And then the updates are just done by message passing, which, which allows for very, very large systems. It scales to however many CPUs you have available. So we can put it on the cloud, allocate um, many CPUs, and then all the processes go out to their separate threads and, and run in parallel. So this uh, can support very, very large simulations um, if needed. Next up on the engine, so how these things run in time. A typical, like a system of ODEs, you have the variables themselves run in time. You, you have a predefined set of variables that are, are simulated. With Vivarium, we can add and remove processes and nodes during runtime. So we might have different processes that trigger things like division. This might seem uh, really apparent that this is required, but it's, it's actually very difficult to pull off computationally. We've tried to make this as simple as possible. Here, let's look at this example of, of what this might mean. So we start off with a system that has an environment in one subsystem, let's say like a cell inside of that environment. It runs for some time until the, the cell passes an update that is to trigger division. The system handles that by launching a whole new process. If this agent had multiple states and processes working within it, it would have to make a, a copy of it. And this could, would then have to run in, in parallel with the first process. So here, A1 divides to make A2 and A3. New processes are launched, and then the simulation resumes. We might then want to say that A2 sees A3 in its environment and engulfs it, so it wants to take it in, passes a, an update to the system that says engulf A3, at which point A3 becomes subsumed inside of A2. And so this is an actual move update that, that uh, changes the, how the topology is wired. And then it runs for some time, and after a while, A3 triggers a burst update in which it let's say pops or lice and all of its internal contents then go into A2. And we end up with kind of where we started with an environment and a single cell inside. So this is another level of simulation with, with kind of graph, graph rewrite during the runtime. Okay, next up, this is the, the third point in our outline, the collective structure. So we want to make it as easy as possible to combine models, to build models, to combine models, and to reconfigure them. And the idea here 
is that we have a collection of open source libraries. A library is just, you, you, can, you can make build processes within them, with different port structures. Vivarium Core is a library we're gonna see soon, which provides the basic interface for making processes and also the engine for running it. So you import, these are all pip importable open source libraries. You import Vivarium Core, use it to make a process around your model, whatever model you prefer. Perfect it, you can release it as a pip package. We've streamlined the, the, the process for releasing it so that other people can then use your process. At first, let's say you develop your process, make sure it's good. You can take these external libraries, processes that other people have, have developed and imported it into your project. And, and then you can recombine, so you can take your process. So let's say over here, you take your process, you take someone else's process from a separate library, maybe a different team, let's say in Caltech, take their process, combine it up with yours. Maybe you even have a set of parameters that you've acquired uh, experimentally. You want to try out these parameters, see how it affects the, the model. So you take your, your parameters, use it to configure the processes, and then now you have a, a brand new model that you can run in time. And, uh, and when you're happy with it, you can release it, share it with the world so that you, they can build upon your, your work, get a step, step close to, to, to better and more complete models. Okay, and so that, that points to, to this desired goal of, of making it as simple as possible to, to build upon prior work. Uh, we want our models in computational biology to continue to, to improve as, as new users pick them up and, and add to them. And so here we're showing a schematic. This is published work uh, by myself and Ryan Spangler, who's, who's somewhere in there in the audience, where we, we start off with, with this uh, first model with three processes, transport, metabolism, and gene expression make sure that it works right, feel confident about it. And then once we're confident, we can take the next step, replace this gene expression process with four more complex processes, get that all tuned up until we're pleased, and, and then add a few more processes. So here we, we add additional chemotaxis processes and flagella which um, here you can see that the flagella themselves are subcompartments. Each flagella has its own internal state and processes that run the flagella in time. Of course, this is far from complete. This is not a whole cell. Ideally, this is something that people will import into their projects and improve upon, and, and slowly we can work our way towards uh, more and more realistic models. Okay, now for a few examples, I'm not going to go into the details here, uh, but, but just to sh kind of show what's possible. Uh, this is a lattice environment. The environment is itself a composite of two processes, the multi-body physics process, which is just a, a physics engine that we put our, the process wrapper around and the diffusion process, which operates on these fields. So we have two, two stores. The agents is A, and it holds variables for location, volume, length, width, mass, and, and forces uh, for these rigid bodies that are the cells. And, and we have a separate store that holds the fields, which are these, they're actually uh, NumPy, 2D NumPy arrays of concentrations that diffusion operates on. And you can plug whatever subcompartment you want into them and run them in time. Here you can see that these are just these, these kind of basic growth division cells that take up nutrients from the environment. You can see the nutrients start to be depleted as the cells grow. Here mass is actually conserved. So the mass that's being taken up from the environment is being put into the cells as they grow and then divide. And the multi-body physics engine, you can see how they're pushing each other apart, ex excluding each other's volume as this thing runs. Our next example 
we'll see an extension, uh, kind of a, a rework of this in the coding section. But here we have our three processes. Metabolism is a flux balance analysis. Uh, and you see that in A. Uh, so we have internal counts of metabolites running in time. The external environment here, you can see that there's some secretions that go up into the environment, but most of them are slowly going down as they're being taken up into the cell. And this is the total mass of this compartment that is growing exponentially in time. So that's the, the, the mass of all of these internal components. Uh, it's combined with a chemical reaction network for uh, transport and also gene expression. And you see at first glucose is taken up. Once glucose is taken up, the LAC-Y protein starts to be expressed. Uh, we have the translation of the LAC protein. This is a transporter that can start to, to take up lactose that's in the environment. And so once that's expressed, lactose goes down. And actually see that, that whereas here in A, with metabolism alone, you have exponential growth. With, uh, with this additional process, once the glucose is depleted, you get this uh, lag phase in which there's no growth. And then growth picks up again once lactose is taken up. Uh, this is the same model as here, just placed into that lattice environment we saw earlier. So we place three cells, we run it in time. You can see over here the glucose is taken up at first, but then there's this kind of halt, so it grows. Uh, there isn't very much glucose here, so, but, but it grows and kind of slows down until here there's a little burst, you can see at the bottom row, a little burst of black Y expression which allows these cells to take up lactose. And when, you, when they can take up lactose, they can start to grow again. And so you can see that some, sometime later, these cells that, that have begun to express lac have uh, grown um, significantly and are expressing a lot of lac. And, and you can even see over here a little bit that lac, uh, lac, lactose is being taken up out of the environment, uh, driving these cells growth. These are lac uh, proteins um, being fluorescent, so-called fluorescently tagged in a computational equivalent of fluorescence. Uh, the colors over on the top two, we, we just add, upon division, we add mutation to the, the, pair, the, the mother cell's color. So, so this, in a way, is the color of the phylogeny. One final example here, this is a, a large-scale model of E. coli chemotaxis. Uh, where we have quite a few different uh, models, uh, different processes combined together. You can see the, the variety of different process and modeling paradigms that have gone into this over here. And um, this on the right shows you the full topology of this model. So we have all of these processes connected to all of these stores. And these are the ports which connect processes to stores. Okay, and when and it runs here, just showing the chemoreceptor process that it responds to ligand concentrations in the environment and adapts. And here we see the flagella model that you can see the, the rotational state of the flagella and how they exert forces onto the, the cell bodies. Here there's, this is an environment with 12 different cells. Six of them have receptors and six of them don't have receptors. The environment has the gradient, a ligand gradient. This is actually an exponential gradient. Um, so that this triangle at the bottom should be an exponential curve, but I couldn't find that in PowerPoint. So that whereas the, the cells without the motors do this random walk, you see kind of almost like a Brownian in motion, randomly uh, moving away from this starting point in green. The ones that have receptors successfully climb up the gradient to, to the increased ligand concentrations. Okay, and uh, now that, that concludes our concepts presentation. Uh, some references are listed here.
we have all these online references for vivarium the vivarium collective which is the the library the different open source libraries we have uh, documentation for vivarium the core engine which provides the interface and the, the engine that that runs it uh, is an open source library available over here collection of of um, processes for modeling under vivarium cell and vivarium bioscript we'll see a little bit more of that uh, in a little bit for loading the systems biology markup language into a a process a vivarium process that has bioscript within it and then there's some publications this paper over here just recently published on E. coli chemotaxis is the very first example, uh, proof of concept of, of vivarium. Whole cell modeling is uh, the, the main application that, that vivarium has been used for. And we have uh, two papers. These are pre-vivarium, a paper on E. coli whole cell model and uh, mycoplasma whole cell model. And then uh, bigraphs, this is the formal structure that I mentioned at the start. And, and here's a paper that we used for the multi-scale simulation. Finally, acknowledgements. I uh, thank you to William Poole for organizing this. What an amazing opportunity. And Ayush uh, for uh, being co-instructors with me on this series. The Vivarium team at Stanford, uh, Ryan Spangler, Chris Skalnick, Gary Morrison, and Marcus Covert. It's been an amazing opportunity to, to work on this software with, with this team. We have TAs for this lecture series. Thank you all. And uh, build a cell PIs, just a few of them listed here, but thank you for making this possible. So, so this has been a build a cell lecture. Build a cell is funded by the NSF and Vivarium has been funded by the NIH.